premium canned meats. Meat makes the meal, and Swift makes such good canned meats. And American Motors, builders of Hudson Motor Cars, Kelvinator Home Appliances, and Nash Automobiles present Walt Disney's Disneyland. When you on a star As you enter this timeless land, one of these many worlds will open to you. Tomorrowland, promise of things to come. Fantasyland, the happiest kingdom of them all. Frontierland, tall tales and true from the legendary past. Adventureland, the wonder world of nature's own realm. Presenting this week, Adventureland. During the next hour, we'll see the Academy Award-winning Seal Island, and we'll go behind the cameras with the Disney naturalist photographers as they film scenes for The Vanishing Prairie, a true life feature to compare with the unforgettable living desert. Our host is Walt Disney himself, and we find him in one of his studio workshops. If there's one question everyone seems to ask about our true life adventures, it's how are we able to pry into the private lives of the animals and get the secrets of nature on film? Well, this is part of the answer, a telephoto lens. It's possible with this lens to get a close-up of an animal a quarter of a mile away. To give you an idea, I'll move it over here. Now, down the studio street, I can see a signpost. It's at least a couple of blocks away, but I can't read it. Now, if I pick it up with the telephoto lens, this is what I see. Of course, the best lens in the world won't get the picture unless the cameraman has the know-how. And that means skill, patience, and ingenuity. And it's this story behind the cameras that we're going to tell right now. So let's move over to our True Life Adventure unit and meet our writer-director of the series, James Alger. You know, we call our cameramen naturalist photographers because they're experienced naturalists as well as operators of cameras. Some are recognized authorities in their field. For example, one's affiliated with a museum, still another is an ornithologist, and another is a marine biologist. In fact, it takes a variety of talents to film our true life adventure stories, especially a project as ambitious as our feature length film, The Vanishing Prairie. Now, a photographer in the field is something of a trespasser, for nature has a way of guarding her own against the prying eye of the camera. But here, let's take a look at some film on the Moviola, and I'll show you what I mean. This is Dick Borden, a specialist on birds in flight. And he's photographed geese and ducks and such from Canada to Texas and from Maine to Oregon. Wherever he goes, Dick always has to overcome the birds' natural fear of humans. And so he set about finding a way to reach their secret hideaways without being conspicuous. To do this, he's rigged up what he calls a sneak boat. This odd contraption is powered by storage batteries. And this electric motor, almost completely noiseless, propels it through the water. Dick, by the way, began his career as a biology major at Harvard, and later was a field worker for the Smithsonian Institute. But now, with all the wires hooked up and the boat ship shape, he's ready for action first loading the all-important camera. This strange craft is guided by his feet, because when Dick's working, both hands are busy with the camera.
Once underway, he looks rather like a floating log. And as a matter of fact, that's the whole idea. Here's what the water world of Marsh and Willow looks like from his water level view. And it's amazing how close Dick gets to his subjects. intimate details in the domestic lives of the swimmers and divers. He sees the geese taking their young goslings for their first swim. Here he sneaks up on a muskrat. So close he can almost shake hands with him. And then there comes the lucky chance he's been waiting for. The shot he's been after from the start. Here they come, the wild geese. On the vast stage of the prairie, the long-eared, long-legged jackrabbit, the sage grouse, and the prairie chicken whose dance is the Indian copy. The graceful antelope. To record each of these film stories required weeks, months, sometimes seasons. And it was a job that called for that priceless knack of being always at the right place at the right time. Now, perhaps the most elusive animal on the North American continent is the bighorn sheep. He's practically never photographed, for trailing him to his skyline lair is a job for the most experienced mountaineer. Up to Cleveland Grant and his wife Ruth, it was all in the day's work. These two have devoted a lifetime to animal photography. Working as a team, they go into the remotest backcountry, and it's a matter of film record that what they go after, they get. Ruth devotes much of her time to recording the acrobatic activities of her photographer husband. Cleve, meanwhile, has his hands full just trying to keep up with the fugitive sheep. And in the end, it takes a good stout length of manila rope and a bit of the cowboy's skill to get where the bighorns are going. If you want a portrait of the bighorn, you must simply follow him to the highest crags. problem of not only getting himself, but also his equipment up to the snow line. But all this effort proved worth the doing. For once arrived on top of the world, Cleve captured a sequence that became a highlight of the vanishing prairie. Children, time to eat! Pram for lunch! What makes them move so fast? Swift's Prem, the double flavor luncheon meat with juicy pork and tender beef. Swift's Prem, the perfect answer to quick to prepare delicious meals. Long on flavor, short on fuss. Just slice and serve for delicious fresh and tender Prem sandwiches to eat at home or on a picnic. Tomorrow have mom get Swift's Prem and remind her of the other Swift's premium canned meats. Chopped beef, extra lean and tender. Beef sandwich steaks for hot roast beef sandwiches. Pork sausages, the only ones fried brown before canning. And canned ham, more natural flavor juices, so juicy it's patented. Remember, meat makes the meal, and Swift makes such good canned meats. Look to Swift for the finest, as Swift starts its second hundred years to serve your family better. Now, when we set out to make our feature film, The Vanishing Prairie, we knew that a chapter on the buffalo was a must. After all, he's almost the symbol of the plains. But how to get the buffalo story onto film? Well, that was quite a problem. 
Still, in our research, we'd come across something rather interesting. It was an old trick the Indians used when they hunted buffalo. Now, of course, the red man used this technique for close-up shooting with his bow and arrow. But, we asked ourselves, why wouldn't the same technique work for close-up shooting with a camera, too? For what the idea was worth, we passed it along to another of our cameramen, Tom McHugh. Tom came out of the University of Wisconsin with a degree in zoology and a tremendous interest in nature photography. And though he'd filmed practically everything in the wild, he'd never before had to dress for the part quite like this. A headdress borrowed from an Indian chief, an old buffalo robe, and Tom was ready for his foray into the midst of the herd. Now he looked like a buffalo, or hoped he did, because there was always the chance the trick might backfire. And there was a moment when it looked as if Tom might be in for a bad time. But with the crisis past, the rest of the herd was content with a more casual inspection. And Tom was accepted as a full-fledged member of the Buffalo Brotherhood. Indeed, he became so interested in the buffalo and their ways, he decided to write a thesis on them for his PhD degree at the university. And after all, who's better qualified than a man who's been a buffalo himself? Tom McHugh witnessed events rarely seen in the wild. A buffalo calf's first attempt to walk. And the obvious maternal concern of the cows when the little fellow got into trouble. The longer Tom worked at this, the more he saw. And then it came to him that a whole new chapter of the prairie story was being opened up. Here, right under his nose, was another of the prairie's vanishing species, the prairie dogs. And here was a chance to record the intimate details of their home life. Cousins of the ground squirrel, these little rodents have a dog-like habit of barking. Thus the name, prairie dog. It's a hectic life nature cut out for them. Such are the dramas, the day-by-day -day wonders, that unfold before the eyes and the lenses of a true life adventure cameraman. By their very nature, the true life photographers are outdoor men, and they don't particularly mind working round the seasons. In winter, however, their difficulties are multiplied considerably. Transportation itself is a problem. And here's how it was solved in getting the winter coverage for the vanishing prairie. Tom McHugh joined James Simon, another of our naturalist photographers, and the two of them made a daring excursion into the heart of buffalo country in the dead of winter. They traveled in a snowmobile, a sort of airplane on ski. As a safety measure, two of these odd vehicles were chartered for the trip. In case one got into trouble, the other could serve as a rescue craft. disguise for close-ups. The heavy drifts had the herd slowed down to a walk. This was snowshoe country, but Jim Simon, born and raised in this part of the world, was on his home ground. A former member of the Wyoming Fish and Game Commission and a one-time director of the Jackson Hole Wildlife Park, he knows his animals and where to find them, even in winter. 
Before long, he trained his camera on one of the most ancient of dramas, the eternal struggle for survival, mountain lion and deer, the hunter and the hunted. When the chase was over, the deer sped safely away, Jim counted it a good day's work, for he had more exciting material for the vanishing prairie. With the change of season, Jim Simon joined forces with Lloyd Beebe. This naturalist photographer was also an authority on the life and habits of the mountain lion. Such are the scenes our photographer. Johnny! Time to eat! Grim for lunch! What makes him move so fast? Swift's Prem, the double flavor luncheon meat with juicy pork and tender beef. Swift's Prem is ready in a jiffy. Slice and serve hot or cold. The perfect answer to quick to prepare delicious meals, long on flavor, short on fuss. Prem and Swift's Brookfield Eggs for breakfast, the ideal way to start any day. Tomorrow, have Mom get Swift's Prem and remind her of the other Swift's premium canned meats. Chopped beef, extra lean and tender. Beef sandwich steaks for hot roast beef sandwiches. Pork sausages, the only ones fried brown before canning. And canned ham, so juicy it's patented. Remember, meat makes the meal, and Swift makes such good canned meats. Look to Swift for the finest as Swift starts its second hundred years to serve your family better. You know, nature always deals in the rare and unexpected. And we've discovered that the problems and habits of the real animals are often funnier than the antics that we dream up for our cartoon characters. I think probably that's the reason why all of us here enjoy making these nature films so much. The True Life staff, by the way, were borrowed from our cartoon productions. James Alger, the writer-director, once animated and directed the cartoons. Some of our True Life staff still double in brass, dividing their time between the two fields. You're about to meet one of those men right now. At the moment, he's devoting the major portion of his time to our cartoon feature, Sleeping Beauty. But he's also one of the writers, as well as the voice of our True Life adventures, Winston Hibbler. Oh, I was just filling in here, writing some lyrics for Sleeping Beauty, but that can wait a little while. I'm sure you're all familiar with this theme you've been hearing. It's one of Tchaikovsky's themes from the Sleeping Beauty Ballet. It's pretty, isn't it? But I'm afraid we're going to leave the world of fantasy behind now and move over here to the world of fact. We're going out on a real true life adventure. And our journey will take us up over the rim of the world to a place called Seal Island. It's such a tiny speck of land, however, we may have a little trouble finding it. Now, here's Alaska, here's the chain of Aleutian Islands, the Bering Sea, and Seal Island, a little pile of barren rock almost lost in the fog-bound reaches of the Northern Sea. But it's here behind this curtain of mist that nature plays out a story strange as fantasy, yet straight from the realm of fact, the saga of the fur seal. Seal Island, theater for the spectacle, lies ready and waiting for the players to make their annual appearance. The time is early spring. And just where the great seal herds spend the winter months, no one really knows. And yet they always return to these barren shores where each season they reenact the story of their kind and bear their young where they themselves were born. month is May, and the play will soon begin. Meanwhile, out on the treeless tundra, the reindeer await the coming of the players. The foxes, too, are year-round residents. All kinds of them. Blues and silvers, and some a sort of compromise. Each year, nature dresses her stage with the bright colors of spring. Here in the shadow of the Arctic Circle, the average summer temperature is around 50 degrees.
And yet these wildflowers somehow manage to thrive. Lupin, bluebells, poppies, many of the wart family, even the delicate violet. And everywhere the rocks display a colorful blanket of lichens. The bouquets are in place, the stage is set. Everything is ready for the homecoming seal. And here they are. First on the scene are the bulls. These are the monarchs of the herd. Big, burly fellows, they weigh almost as much as a horse. The seal has often been called the seagoing bear. As a matter of fact, they did have a common ancestor. Following a timeless custom, the bulls arrive at the island a month or so before the females. On these cool, foggy beaches, they'll establish their harem. For the seal is polygamous and may have as many as a hundred wives. These first comers are called beach masters. And for good reason. For a beach master must be big enough and strong enough to hold his home site against all comers. When the beach masters move in, the older residents move out. For the next few weeks, the bulls will have nothing to do but wait for the females. Once the harem is captured, however, the beachmaster must be always on the alert, for protecting his household becomes a full-time job. There won't even be time for meals. The bull goes through the entire summer without eating. He exists solely on the fat stored up in his immense bull neck. Now, for the moment, a temporary truce prevails as the beachmasters doze and wait and watch the sea. Meanwhile, in the gallery seats along the neighboring cliffs, the migrant birds move in to watch the show and set up summer housekeeping. Wild birds by the thousands. Many of them have flown 3,000 miles to nest here. It's the early bird indeed who gets the best spot on these narrow ledges. While this may not seem like the best spot for a nest egg, to the birds, these forbidding rocks are havens of safety. Here's the firstborn helping his brother out of the shell. This handsome matron is Mrs. Kittywake. Mother and babies are doing well. And they're born hungry. Indeed, Mr. Kittywake spends practically all of his time hunting a fish dinner for the family. Other seaside residents are the puffins. There are several varieties. This one is tufted with sideburns that trail in the breeze and the horned puffin. Brightly colored and gay, this little fellow with the oversized bill is often called the sea parrot. It takes both wing and claw to hold a perch on this crowded ledge, where there's standing room only, and not much of that. Mother Nature must have dipped into the rainbow when she painted the parrot of the sea. Like the seal, these birds come back season after season to the island where they were born. Meanwhile, the vigil of the beachmasters goes on and on. Some grow restless and search for better vantage points. Others wait patiently through the long twilight hours. But now, over Seal Island, an atmosphere of tension has begun to grow. For with the dawn will come the month of June, 
and with it, the ladies. Yes, here they are at last, right on schedule, swimming and diving playfully as though glad their journey is over. But they don't seem in any great hurry to go ashore. Perhaps they're just playing hard to get, taking their time, looking over the prospects, having a final fling of single blessedness. Eventually, however, they must make their choice for better or for worse, so some of them start coming in. Among the welcoming committee, rivalry mounts. Tempers flare as the bulls raise their manly voices to attract the females. The march of the brides continues and competition increases. <laughs> of course, there's always one who just can't make up her mind. The harems are formed by the simple process of rounding up the females and escorting them to the various home sites along the beach. Finally, all the females join the parade to the wedding rocks. There are no old maids on Seal Island. A caress or two, and another bride is added to the harem. Thus, community life in the colony begins. The beachmaster, well pleased with himself, settles down to watch over his new wives as they take their beauty naps, sleeping heads gracefully up. Ah, what more could one wish? A good home, adoring wives, a peaceful paradise. Sometimes there's trouble in paradise. For every now and then, some fickle female manages to elude the watchful eye of her lord and master. This is what happens when an irate husband discovers one of his wives in a neighbor's harem. Maybe she felt she made a mistake in her choice of master, but that makes no difference. Changing one's mind is not a female's privilege up here. truce of the first few days is over. Now every bull must consider all the other males his personal enemies. Fights break out constantly. Fierce, jealous rage among the rivals. Especially if a couple of fighters trespass on another's property. Possession is more than nine points of the law here. Possession is the law. Here's a bull grabbing a wife for himself. He's determined to have a harem even if there's only one bride in it. He's certainly taking no chances. He has her and he's going to keep her. A curious thing about the seal is its playfulness, its sense of fun, developed beyond that of most wild creatures. In the water, of course, they're as graceful and clever as mermaids. But on land, too, they engage in many forms of play. The beach master, of course, doesn't indulge in such foolishness. It's beneath his dignity. The jealous husband still seems to be having his troubles. He's finding out it's one thing to have a bride and another to hold her. Courtship and battle, birth and growth, and replenishment of the species, going on continually among the many rookeries. Yet out of this seeming chaos, a kind of order grows, and the great colony settles down to a comparatively peaceful existence. There are more than 100,000 seal on this one beach. Looks like Coney Island on the 4th of July. Now it's late June, and the rookeries are alive with new babies. Seal Island has become a huge nursery. One pup and only one is born to a mother seal each season. This is the pup from the mating of the previous summer. It's born a few days after mother comes ashore and before she mates again. 
Seal pups are coal black at birth and weigh from eight to 10 pounds. They're nursed like any other mammal. The baby seal gather in groups or pods for comfort, for safety, and for school. Yes, school. Because they learn by practice what they must know as grown-ups in order to survive. Like all small fry, the baby seal imitate what they see and hear. They fight just like their fathers, make all the proper sounds of battle and puff and puff, and of course, wear each other out. After the pup is born, the beach master relaxes his discipline and allows mother an occasional day off. As a nursing mother, she must eat well and sometimes has to swim a hundred miles or more out to sea in search of herring and squid and pollock. On these long journeys, her life is in constant danger from her mortal enemies, the killer whale and the shark. Meanwhile, it's Father's Day to look after the kids. Who decided to slip away and see the world on his own? The young explorer. The great adventure is barely underway when he suddenly remembers something he forgot lunch. Well, there's only one answer to that mother. What's this? Somebody ahead of him? Wrong mother. A mother seal will nurse only her own pup, and she can't be fooled. She always knows her own. So this little fellow will have to keep on looking until he finds the mother he belongs to, or until she finds him, if she finds him. And there are some mighty big ifs in this world where survival is a daily battle. Or if mother, in her search for food, has fallen prey to her enemies of the deep, there's real trouble brewing for this youngster. Did we mention trouble? <laughs> When 800 pounds of blubber parks on your flipper, there's not much you can do about it but yelp. And wait until the big bully makes up his mind to move. Free at last. It's a hard life, this survival of the fittest. Since no one else will nurse him, let's hope Mother comes home soon. For if anything has happened to her, this pup will surely die. There are no orphans on Seal Island. Ed, will you pass the butter cake, too? Sure, honey, next trip. How am I doing? Great. Job's yours, but how about that soda for Mr. Baxter? All ready. Just the way he likes it. Always thinking. What's the specialty of the house tonight? Peach. Peach ice cream. With good fresh peaches on top. Boy, doesn't it look super? You sold me. Fix me a peach sundae. Peach? That's the ice cream festival flavor. Say, I've got orders for second. Naturally. Ice cream's more fun than anything. <laughs> That's why we call it America's fun food. Besides, it's refreshing and extra nourishing. Remember, ice cream and all the other wonderful dairy foods you enjoy begin with milk. And you'll never outgrow your need for milk. Uh-oh, that's a big ocean out there. And this little fellow would better give it a wide berth. For curiously enough, seal pups are born without knowing how to swim. Careful. Whoop. By the way, what's father doing about this? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. Now what's this? More trouble? Better look out. One slip here and it's a long, long way down. Ah, here comes Mother at last. 
She seems to sense that there's trouble afoot, and of course her first thought is for her pup. By some mysterious instinct, she'll be able to recognize him among all the thousands of pups on the island. That is, if she can find him. As for father, hmm, cool, calm, and collected. Ah, at last, rescued in the nick of time. Whoops. Well, as a babysitter, father was a total loss. Reunion, and a happy ending. But best of all, lunch. What a day. In the few short weeks before September, when the seal herd will leave the island, the pups must master the art of swimming. For seal pups must learn to swim like any land animal. And so the swimming lesson becomes one of the most important activities of the summer. In a little tidewater pool, they venture their first dip. Somewhat cautiously at first. But after some trial and error and a ducking or two, they soon learn what their flippers are for. An important part of their schooling is learning to breathe for long submersion. bubbles in the old swimming hole is all part of their training. Here's a youngster braving the deep on his first practice jump. A very little fellow in a very big wet world. The males from two to five years old are known as bachelors, and bachelors they are indeed. For all the females belong to the beach masters and are members of one harem or another. Free from the burdens of family life, these gay young blades frisk and play at water sports and generally have a good time for themselves. The bachelor's living areas among the rocks and driftwood are usually inland. And this creates a curious situation, for they're completely cut off from the shoreline by the harems of the beach masters. By unwritten law, however, the bachelor is permitted to travel to and from the sea along certain avenues or corridors between the harems. And he's unmolested, so long as he keeps to the straight and narrow. But one bull may have many wives and many bulls none may seem unfair and unjust. But it's nature's way of keeping up the quality of the herd. Only the strongest bull can keep a harem. Only he is fit, according to nature, to propagate the species. And so, living among the bachelors may be found these dethroned monarchs. Once proud beach masters, they've been defeated in bloody combat and have lost their right to rule over a harem. These are the saddest of all failures. Compelled to remain on the sidelines, minus wives, minus family, Minus everything. And so constantly faced with these sad reminders that only the fit may survive, the young bulls spend much of their time training for the one big event of their lives, the day when they can challenge the beach master for a right to a harem. Right now, the youngsters are hardly a match for the veteran bulls. They'll have to wait till they're six years old and fully grown. 
Meantime, they become one another's sparring partners. They shadow box, lunge and parry, dodge and feint, until they know all the vulnerable spots, the throat, the eyes, and especially the flipper. For a disabled flipper may well turn the tide of battle when the going gets rough. It's rough and tumble and no holes barred through every waking hour as the young bachelor trains for his big day. And that day must inevitably come. Sooner or later, the young boy will tire of single blessedness. Well, on Seal Island, to become a family man, the harem must be taken by force. The youngster must pit his few brief years of training against all the experience and savage fury of a veteran beachmaster. But no matter the odds, the primitive urge for battle cannot be denied. Recklessly, he oversteps the bounds, enters forbidden territory. There he goes, the challenger. The beachmasters growl their warning. Instantly, the whole island is alerted. Here comes the charge. of a dozen battles, the older bull has plenty of experience. But this time, youth and speed and power prove too much for it, and he's forced to give ground. The tide of battle turns. Quick to sense the change, the other harem bulls suddenly turn on their former comrade and help the challenger clinch his victory. Driven out by his kind, Battle scarred and bloody, the old beach master seeks the healing waters of the Arctic Sea. He's had his day and youth must be served. And so, a new beach master. The king is king no more. Long live the king. On Seal Island, the days pass, the swift, hectic summer days. June, July, August. By September, the great fur seal host has completed its birth cycle once more. Again, the herd sets out on its long migration, heading southward into the Pacific, through the Aleutian Passes, beyond Unamak and the island of the Four Mountains, convoying the new generation swimming no man knows where. Yes, once more, the players in the great spectacle vanish into mystery. And Mother Nature rings down her curtain of mist on another true life adventure, the saga of Seal Island. Sometimes. That's what they think. Cause this is my laughing place. <laughs> he gotta come out sometime. <laughs> they don't know that this is an American motors car with all season air conditioning. Yes, all season air conditioning. Another exclusive feature from American Motors. Now you can say goodbye to sweltering hot cars, to choking <laughs> dust and exhaust, to shivering in zero cold. With all-season air conditioning, you simply turn one knob to ride cool in summer, warm in winter, and enjoy filtered fresh air in any weather all year round. 
own a spectacular new Rambler with complete year-round air conditioning. It's the lowest-priced air-conditioned car in America. Yes, low-cost all-season air conditioning is the right kind for you. And you're so right to choose a 55 Rambler cross-country, now at all Nash dealers, with all the glamour of a luxurious family sedan plus the utility of a rugged station wagon. Another reason why American Motors means more for Americans. Uh, yep, you get more car for your money when you buy, more money for your car when you trade. Next week's show will come to you from Fantasyland. Now, here are a few of the highlights. Be with us next week as Walt Disney takes you behind the scenes for a final progress report before the official opening of the fabulous new Disneyland. You'll watch the creation of an entire world of fun and fantasy, facts and fiction. You'll share the creative joys and anxieties as each far-flung piece of a fantastic jigsaw puzzle is completed and fitted into place. You'll see the real magicians of Hollywood, the designers and craftsmen of the motion picture industry, as they join their skills with experts from every part of the globe to create a land of dreams such as the world has never seen before. Before your eyes, you'll watch a Mississippi River steamboat, miniature railroads, merry-go-round horses, lions, rhinos, midget speed cars, all coming off the world's most unusual assembly line. Then, as the deadline for opening day draws nearer and nearer, as the Disney teams turn into the home stretch and race for the finish, you'll find yourself in the midst of the activity in a fever that combines the opening night of a Broadway musical, an Olympic track meet, a squirrel cage, and a Donnybrook Fair all in one. You'll see all this culminating in a modern miracle, Walt Disney's lifelong dream of Disneyland, a place of hopes and fancies, facts and fiction come true at last. And on the same program, you'll see the little guy who made it all come true. The rags to riches story. The life and times of the world's most fabulous four-footed creature, Mickey Mouse. Quiet, Poodle. From his first moving picture to his great Broadway triumph, co-starring with the famous Philadelphia Symphony Orchestra. <laughs> Next week, the final behind-the-scenes report before the official opening of Disneyland and the story of Mickey Mouse coming to you from Disneyland. Once upon a time, when Cinderella longed to go to the ball, her fairy godmother appeared and gave her a beautiful gown. Now, what about a carriage? How fitting. The world's most beautiful, most modern car. A 1955 Nash Ambassador. Only trouble, it may be too modern for Cinderella. I know, let's make Cinderella modern. Let's turn her into Miss America. Hello, I'm Lee Merriweather, and being Miss America makes me feel like a modern Cinderella, especially when I drive my beautiful new Nash. And no wonder, Nash for 55 has the trend-setting look that has all America talking, with new safety headlights set low in the grill, and new ceramic windshield, widest of any car, and of course there's all-season air conditioning. One simple knob cools you in the summer, warms you in winter, and just look, the widest front seats of any car. With a rainbow choice of rich leathers and fabrics, enjoy wonderful airliner reclining seats that make the longest drive seem short. You can even nap the children on long trips. Why don't you drive the brilliant new Ambassador or the exciting new Statesman at your Nash dealers now? Let him turn your old car into a Nash. 
Next week, Disneyland will be brought to you by American Motors, builders of Nash automobiles, Kelvinator Home Appliances, and Hudson Motor Cars, and the Dairy Farmers of America through the American Dairy Association, reminding you to drink one, two, three glasses of milk a day. You'll never outgrow your need for milk. When your heart is in your dream, get ready for one of the happiest times of your life. Soon, this summer, at your favorite theater, you'll be able to see Walt Disney's first all-cartoon feature in Cinemascope, Lady and the Tramp. It will be showing in theaters from coast to coast this summer. Watch for the opening date of Walt Disney's Lady and the Tramp in Cinemascope and Technicolor. It's his happiest motion picture. This has been an ABC television network presentation.